Welcome to Sports BKC, the Kansas City Stars Daily Sports Podcast. It's Tuesday, June 16th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Today, star columnist Vahe Gregorian stops by, and we talk about some of the recent news in college sports and the leverage muscle some athletes are flexing. Incidents involving Oklahoma State, Texas, and Iowa in just the past few days suggest some athletes are serious about certain changes in tradition, symbols, and even personnel at their schools. They've been emboldened by Black Lives Matter protests and are using their platform as athletes to seek change. After a break, Vahe tells us about his morning spent at one of the most uplifting places in Kansas City. So, okay, here we go. We'll start with audio from the the, the video that Oklahoma State coach Mike Gundy and Chuba Hubbard put together early on uh, Monday evening. In light of today's tweet with the uh, t-shirt I was wearing, um, I uh, I met with um, some players and uh, realized it's a very sensitive issue with what's going on uh, in today's society. And so we had a great meeting and uh, made aware of some things that uh, players feel like that can make our organization, our culture even better than it is here at Oklahoma State. And I'm looking forward to making some changes and it starts at the top with me and we got good days ahead. I'll start off by first saying that I went about I went about it the wrong way by tweeting. I'm not someone that you know has to you know tweet something to make change. I should have went to him as a man, and I'm all, I'm more about action. So that was bad on my part. But from now on, we're going to focus on bringing change, and that's the most important thing. Hello, Vahe. Hi, Blair. You say that with a little edge, <laughs> uh, but it's an edgy time. It is a little bit of an edgy time. Um, a couple things I want to get to, or we should talk about right off the bat. Um, we're talking, uh, as I said in the in- introduction on Tuesday, uh, there was some news this morning involving the College Football Hall of Fame. The ballot is out, and uh, some local interest. Eric Bieniemy is on the ballot. Tony Gonzalez, Darren Sproles is on the ballot for the first time. Michael Bishop. Uh, the, the K-State Stars, and for the first time, Gary Pinkle, the University of Missouri football coach for, for 15 years. And I was reminded when I was reading the ballot that he's the winningest coach at two schools. He's got the most victories not only at Missouri but at Toledo, which, uh, which, is, which is interesting and might help his chances of, of getting into the College Football Hall of Fame, maybe as a first ballot guy. And then, of course, um, we're going to talk about this later, but you had an interesting morning visiting one of the more uplifting places, I think, in Kansas City. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on that. But, okay, we got the news out of the way, and, and we've teased the, the second part of the podcast. What you and I are going to talk about now is something that I didn't think that we would talk about on Tuesday, but then Monday unfolded the way that it did. Starting at about 2.30 in the afternoon... Uh, the, the picture on Twitter, maybe somewhere on social media, I saw it on Twitter, appeared with Oklahoma State football coach Mike Gundy wearing a T-shirt of, of the news network. I think OAN, is that yes, what it is? Yes, One American News. And, and over the course of the next few hours, <clears throat> Oklahoma State players, African-American Oklahoma State players, uh, took to social media to, to express how – disappointed and angry they were that their coach would be seen publicly in that t-shirt. So the day ended and then about five hours later after the the, the, uh, the image appeared on social media, the day ended with Mike Gundy and Chuba Hubbard, the running back whose, um, whose tweet was really set the wheels in motion for the, for the feelings that uh, were expressed by black Oklahoma State players and former players. Um, giving a, one of those uh, dual messages together, and then bro hugged it out at the end, and uh, and you heard that at the top of uh, you heard that at the top of our of our podcast here. So, what I wanted to ask you, Vahe, is it's not the first thing. This is the this is not the first instance we've seen of college athletes, and I guess college football players, uh, mostly what we're talking about using their positions to protest, not in the streets, although there, some of that has happened, but to protest traditions and uh, personnel and just, um, just things that they find offensive to them in a way that I've never, I, I, I've rarely seen it. Now, we're going to talk about one way that we have seen it 
uh, in, about five years ago. But in the moment, I, I'm just I'm fascinated by this, and it's it's as if the protest of the last couple weeks have emboldened these athletes to speak out against what they see as racist, you know, uh, racism in the in the form of an OAN T-shirt or the Eyes of Texas fight song, or the, the, the University of Iowa strength and conditioning coach who was dismissed earlier. So I'm, I, anyway, I'm, I'm finding all this really fascinating and I want to know what you thought about it. Well, it, it's interesting. I, I, as you said the word, I think you said emboldened, I was thinking about empowered, and, and those words are maybe a little the same, a little, little distinction, but, but what often happens, especially with this kind of thing, it seems to me, is... You've got some forces amassing, converging, whatever you want to say, all at once. Right? We are in a historic, and who knows, maybe it'll be a, a, certainly a, a 50-year-ish, maybe longer tenure of uh, social upheaval in the name of racial, and you know, alleviating racial injustice and, and speaking to racial injustice and oppression. Um, meanwhile, this is also coming at a time where college athletes, are, there's, there's, I don't know if it's a tectonic shift. If that, is that the word tectonic? Uh, yeah. The plate shifting, but 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 we've seen a lot of movement on that uh, in terms of identity and uh, you know control of your image and branding. I'm not sure about this. I haven't really studied this this way, but I I feel like there's some some back and forth on that energy, like that that's all coming together at once. It could be this is just independent energy here too, right? It's it absolutely coming out of out of the most immediate um, emotional right the, aspect the, the, of the news of the moment yeah um, but but I like the idea I had thought about it that way but I, I do like that thought of the synergy between I- I- empowering athletes for their name image and likeness and their uh, their feeling of um, you know of, of of writing what they think are historical wrongs right you know? yeah. and I you know. Let's just take them individually, or a couple of them. The ones that are uh, in the Big Twelve. That, that I, I didn't know about the eyes of Texas. No. I, and I, Cedric Golden, our buddy at the at the Statesman, and, and we'll link to his story. He wrote, wrote a really interesting column about that, where that um, where this is coming from. In in uh, but there but it's um, there there are some racial uh, I- images and and um, it's it's not. Um, it, it's not just the song. There's some uh, some buildings at the University of Texas that were named for Confederate, you know, entities. And uh, yeah, and, I saw four, four or five different buildings. Yeah, buildings. Um, our, our friend Mike Finger uh, also wrote about it some. And and you know, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but but it's interesting to me about the eyes of Texas. Speaking as a, a, a guy who was seven, eight, nine years old, living in Austin, Texas, with his dad teaching at UT, um, and. You know, one of the first symbols I knew to do was the the hook on my hook. I hope I'm not speaking to something with that that that's become uh, notorious from some history I don't know. But the eyes of Texas itself, and it disabuse me of this if you if you if you will, Blair. But I don't recall whether there's it's objectionable in its lyrics. I think what I understood it to be was objectionable in its um, in its making and its origins. You're right. It's connected to minstrel shows. Yes. Um, with characters in blackface. Yes. So this and this was in the early early 1900s, and so you're right. I, I, I think it's a, it, the song's a minute long. Right. And I think if you break down the lyrics, you you wouldn't find an offensive lyric in it. But it's I guess it's the origin of the song, and where it was played, and and the the connotations of of that. So, uh, but but it's I'll tell you, it, it is as much a. And that's been out there before, by the way, with it, Texas, it has right? Been. I mean, it's been a couple of years in the making leading up to that. And, we, and, we've heard some, and we've heard some Texas players say they just gritted their teeth when they were forced to sing it because Texas athletes sing it after games. Um, win or lose, they sing it. They uh, in, On road games, I've seen them go over to where the Texas band is in the corner of the stadium, whether they've won or lost the game, and, and you know have their hook and horns fingers up, and, and they sing the eyes of Texas. And I've... I've seen it at the, at the Cotton Bowl after the, the, the Texas OU game, win or lose, and, of course, at all home games. So it's every bit of, you know, for, I guess for a Texas Longhorn fan, it is such a an emotional, powerful 
musical piece, right? Yeah. And, I, you know, really, I'm, I, I don't want to overstate this point, but I, I think it's the first song I knew the words to as a kid because of being there. So it's that you're that indoctrinated in it without any understanding of, of the aspects we're talking about now. So you, you tend to see it on its face. You know, and, and certainly no pun intended, but I mean, you tend to see it on, on the, the the superficial image of what's there, and that's a whole other discussion in itself about that. It's interesting you mentioned that about, you know, the idea of sort of eradicating the the past symbols of oppression or or statements of oppression. What's also happening though is they're speaking to <laughs> their own uh, strength, athletes' own strength in dealing with their current leaders absolutely i mean it's it's so you know it's not twin movement they're not unrelated right no 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 and and no and no example is greater than what happened at oklahoma state yesterday which was just remarkable in i you know you and i often joke about our age and how we're we're always trying to catch up with technology at our age but joke (laughs) 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 but I, I'm sorry. Even even the most tech savvy person had to be amazed at how that story uh, came to life, gained life, and uh, was re- not resolved. But you know, at, at least in, in, I guess in the minds of Mike Gundy, had a at least a, a you know a period by you know less in less than five hours, because in on Monday late afternoon, this was the story that was going around the sports world yesterday was. Mike Gundy wearing his OAN T-shirt for a well, – he was on a fishing trip, and he was posing with the fish, right? Right. right. So he's wearing the T-shirt. Or with friends, I think, with, what I, the one I saw. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, and, then, uh, and then his players see it, including Chuba Hubbard, the, the nation's top returning rusher and Heisman Trophy candidate, and a guy that um, you know, will, will be in the NFL after, after this season, who had to, to actually turn down uh, you know, to, to the NFL draft this past year to come back and play another year, and his – Highly regarded teammates were in full support of him. At least his, his black teammates were. So, yeah. just amazing how quickly that sprang to life. Well, something else you made me think of when you were referring to our age. It, it, this is true too, though. This is this is part of this this story. Is the evolution of the the, the player coach relationship, and we're seeing you know a, potentially a whole new tier of that. But but what we're certainly seeing is the day of authoritarian rule of every aspect of the program. I mean, now there's still coaches that are control freaks and probably, you know, you don't have to look too far or think too hard about who, who still holds, you know, players, you know, in their spell. But, I mean, we grew up on, on you know, the coach's word was the absolute word and, and no, no players were going to buck the system. And, and uh, the, you brought this up kind of at the start, but the leverage has changed. The leverage is changing with this. And I think it reminds me a little bit of the feeling we had in the initial days of the coronavirus where you start thinking you have your arms around the scope of it. I feel like maybe I don't really have my arms around the scope of it. I feel like I can't quite project what the next aspects of this are. Oh, I, I certainly don't either, except um, in the cases so far, at least in college sports, where... Um, an athlete has expressed whatever anger, dis- disillusionment, displeasure at uh, at something that the school, uh, either a tradition or a coach or whatever, the 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 coach hasn't stood up and said uh, no, no, I'm right, you're wrong. I mean that, or you you better fall in line. That hasn't happened yet. It's been just the opposite. Um, uh, the 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 coach has found a way to um, yeah, and I'm. I'm you know, this 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 doesn't correlate to colleges, but the what what Mike Gundy did yesterday, and it wasn't an apology, but it was in a kind of an admission of um, not understanding what it, what the, the meaning of his T-shirt, and we should probably exp- explain what that T-shirt is. OAN is a is a right wing news network. I've never seen it. I don't even know if it's on my basic cable. I yeah, but, I don't think it's on my basic cable. The only indications I've seen of it are. In frankly, in news conferences uh, with the president, where it is um, the questions I've seen have been uh, actually not really journalistic questions, but questions that are um, as if they are part of the Trump campaign. Right. Um, 
and very sort of accusatory and leading and really not asking a question, almost making a rhetorical statement. That's been my, my few observations of it have been that. That's my, been my only exposure to it. And obviously it's taken on, it's fascinating to me actually that the identity is that understood that Chuba Hubbard was cognizant of it. I, I, right. I, I you know, it, it, I don't, I don't, I have not tracked that part of the story why or what it is that led him to be that cognizant of something that maybe most people aren't. But it, it suggests to me that he's been following the news, suggests to me that he's you know, socially alert, um, but, I, but I don't know those things. Well, and certainly uh, one, one area that, uh, that has angered a lot of people is Black Li- or, or the um, OAN has described Black Lives Matter as a farce, um, and right. a, a radical uh, right. You know, yeah, good point. Much more salient. I, I just think I that's saying. what that's where the. I'm sure that's the crux of it. Yeah, th- that's right. So, so, so what? What Mike Gundy? He didn't. He didn't come out and apologize, but showed some contrition in you know in uh, um, in, in, in the uh, in the video that he, he cut with uh, with Hubbard. But it reminded me a little bit of what Drew Brees did over a quick you know over basically a 24 hour period where he you know was out where he was. Condemning those that didn't stand for the national anthem, got the criticism from from New Orleans Saints players and and others around the NFL. And the next day, did apologize and express a lot of remorse for what his, you know, what he said the previous day. This reminded me a little bit of that, not to the, that extent though. So, well, it's interesting how Drews, and there, I'm sure there are many different views of the from the, on the spectrum of how how that played out with Drew Brees, right? But we we know Drew Brees to be. Uh, great football player and pretty great citizen, right? His efforts with Katrina and things like that. We know him to have had a real carved out stance on how he saw uh, the protest during the anthem and that he doubled down on it basically initially, even without thinking he was. But then we have the, the, the rest of the outcome, which is what seems to me to be not a response to pressure as much as I think I think he conveyed a sense of enlightenment. I think his rationale changed. I think he understood, and it's been hard for some people to to embrace this point, but what the protests are really about. And for whatever reason, it, so many people have succeeded in conflating it with something it's not. And, but it's been, you know, uh, the stance of, um, you know, uh, certain elements of the public that, that, that to, to prevent it from to delegitimize it by taking that stance, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I see that, and I think a common link between uh, the the Breeze apology and what Gundy did yesterday was maybe for the first time, and because of the reaction, they they thought about what Black Lives Matter and the protest, what it meant to the black athletes, and not what it you know what it meant to them, or what or or, or at least. I, I think we can guess from their initial, you know, the, the T-shirt and what Bree said originally was they hadn't given it a whole lot of thought, right? That um, I just see guys protesting and don't understand what the what right. the message is. And whoever's in their ear or maybe a, a preconceived notion of what that says without really – and I do think this, Blair, I, 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 I think that there is a – I think there's a sort of listening and hearing – distinction right now that is different than we've known certainly in these last years with these sorts of movements but maybe even in a certain way in our lifetimes maybe 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 we'll um, see how, how yeah, that yeah, plays we'll, out we'll, right we'll know yeah we'll know when we do uh yeah. a podcast a year from now <laughs> yeah right <laughs> Whether yeah the, you know how much <laughs> things have changed yeah um well let's circle back to the beginning because we mentioned gary pinkle at, at the top of this segment and uh, and Gary was caught up in something similar to this five years ago. Maybe Missouri, Missouri, a little ahead of the curve on uh, on, on Black Lives Matter and protesting, and um, because it happened on the at the Columbia campus in 2015, November of 20 October, November of 2015, and um, and Gary was in a found himself in a in a difficult position that um, I don't want to say he mishandled, but but I think if. If, if you could script the perfect response for Gary, it would be different than what the response ended up being for for Gary. Um, it was it was an incredibly difficult time because in the background of all of it, uh, protests on campus 
and the threat of a boycott of a game, Gary was among the very few who knew at the moment he had, you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma and that this was going to be his last year. So he's dealing with that and then having to be the face of the program at a time when I don't know if the players were interested in, you know, being part of the program. So the reason we're circling back to Gary because he's he was named a finalist or on the ballot for the college football Hall of Fame today. So what what do you remember about those few well, days? Well, just a, a quick thing. I do want to just interject before I start on that part. Just and I think we both feel this way. What what a what a worthy candidate Gary is for that. When you when no you doubt about it. He would. At, I would. Yeah. I'd vote for him in a heartbeat. He, yeah. he, he'll whether he gets in the first ballot or not. He'll be in the College Football Hall of Fame, and I think he deserves to be as. Soon as you can get him in, get him in. Yeah, I, I feel like that too, and and we, we probably no no need in, in the time we have to recite all that. Maybe that's a, you know when 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 the votes come or when we get a chance, we can do a whole thing on Gary. But but that's really cool. Um, I think it was a time of such you know just chaos and flux, right? So much was happening really fast, and as you just noted, I mean uh, against a backdrop in which he is uh, dealing with cancer. And, you know, what do I do and all right. that? I think what, what happened was Gary had a, uh, a, he had the conviction to know he was going to stand with his players no matter what, right? That he was going to, and this is at a time, by the way, I think this is not dissimilar to what we're seeing right now. I think players at that moment, their spirits were beyond just that I'm a football player, right? They weren't, I mean, they understood they had leverage with it, but with certain leaders of theirs and things like that, they were they were called as people to use this platform. And I think understood that there could be some serious ramifications for them and just sort of said, yeah, that's too bad. But we're, right. you know, I, I do think that. I think, and I think there was a, a courageousness to that that maybe we've underestimated or understated. Maybe, maybe at least me, I, maybe I have. Um, so Gary took the stance of, I'm gonna support my players What's a little unclear is to what degree he really understood that the way the argument had been laid out was if you're standing with the players who have called for a, a you know, potential boycott unless they fire the president of the university, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> then you are, in fact, standing with the players calling for the firing of the president of the university. And if I recall correctly, and I didn't look back at this, if I recall correctly, that those were the parameters. Or we're going to boycott unless we fire president in in conjunction with the uh, concerned student, concerned student 1950 the whole movement right is that what right. I was concerned yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I think Gary just understood that first and foremost you can't alienate your players and was I think willing to enter the fray that way I'm not sure if he fully had a grasp on what that was saying I'm just not sure I don't right. want to say he didn't but but I don't know if he did because he sort of reframed it over the course of the next couple of days. Right. And as you said, the, um, the interestingly enough, the next game was to be played at Arrowhead Stadium yeah. against BYU. And um, Gary announced that week that he was stepping down as the coach because of cancer. So, Which, I mean, what a, what a 72 hours or oh, so. Oh, my gosh. And I think there was probably, uh, you know, some – what what's that expression we're supposed to use in our in our job, Blair? If, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. I mean, get a second source. Certainly, yeah, second source. I never did find that second source. Um, but 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 I do think that, you know that came with some skepticism because of all the unrest. Like you know what's going on here, and I I, I obviously I, it's been borne out since. That, yeah, and even pretty much in the moment. But um, it was such a turbulent time and. I remember being on the field at Arrowhead after the game and just trying to, you know, whatever it is we think we were doing by being down there in the scrum. And, and suddenly I'm standing like, I feel like I was almost in the middle of players getting Gary to dance. And like I had to like I pull out of there and got some shaky video. But it seemed like, I bring that up just because I do feel like there was some, it wasn't just that Gary's leaving. There was, there was there, you know, he's going to step down and at the end of the season there was a genuine level of affection that just really felt like it was right there in that moment and for all these reasons that I think we're talking about. Well, here's hoping that um, uh, when, it when it comes time to, to vote him in, and there's a committee uh, that, that'll, uh, that'll meet and vote for what'll amount to, uh, there were 
probably close to 150 players and I think um, more than 20, 20, as many as 20 coaches from all levels and, and, and classifications of college football that are on the ballot for the, uh, for the College Football Hall of Fame. And they pick about a dozen players and a couple of coaches. Uh, Bob Stoops is also on the list for the first time. So, you know, he's a slam dunk. But um, here's hoping that, um, that, it, that, that Gary finds his way into the College Football Hall of Fame sooner rather than later. And Vahe, we're going to take a quick break. And I want to come, when we come back, I want to talk about your morning in Kansas City. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. And that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Back with Vahe Gregorian. Vahe, where were you this morning? So, Blair, uh, I was at reopening day because apparently we're not going to have an opening day. So I consoled myself with reopening day at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And uh, I'll tell you, it, it, it was great to see Bob Kendrick in a suit again. The last few times I've seen him, he's been in varying uh, uh, other styles of dress that we're just not used to. So that it, it was a, just a little bit of sunshine, right? I went over there a few minutes into sitting down in Bob's office with him. Uh, the interview was called to a halt because the staff had a bunch of cards for him and a pound cake for him for his birthday yesterday. Aw. Which I, I suggested to Bob that he may have put off the reopening so he could have yesterday to play 36 holes. But but no, he, it was today was the right day for the reopening. So... We got a chance to. He has not been in the museum much these last three months. Actually, you know, in the in the uh, display area. So we went over there. And he showed me a couple of new things, uh, including their barrier breakers exhibit, which will chronicle the stories of each barrier breaker for each team. Uh, from and I think most people wouldn't probably know this. It's hard for me to remember. But the last integrated team wasn't until 1959. So you have Jackie in 47. Wasn't the Red Sox? Well played. Pumps, yes. Pumpsy, Pumpsy Green. Green. Yeah. I, I don't know how many people would, would just know that <laughs> off the top of your head. Well, it's because they were the last. But they were the last. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's been some interesting news with, with the Red Sox of late in terms of how they've you yeah, know, reflected sure. on this, this time. So long story short, though, uh, they reopened today. Great to see Bob preparing to receive people he's he's not sure yet though he's gonna be playing by ear how often how much how he can provide tours he's you know trying to figure out it you know is there a small number can i get there i was there when he had to go do another interview when the first guest arrived and it was a a nice woman from brooklyn who was driving through with her husband to colorado and she was very uh keen on the civil rights aspect of the museum wanted in fact so keen on civil rights that she wanted to know if i could guide her to any protests in town today <laughs> there actually is one going on right now at oh the, at I, city hall i think well i hope to hear from her shortly because i i told her i would check it out and let her know but i really appreciated her her thoughtfulness mm-hmm. um I'll, I'll write a little bit about her in this the story i'll i'll uh do this afternoon and that'll be part of the story links part of the story links and it, it also part of that was uh you know sort of speaking to bob a little bit about the the news or lack thereof of the day of uh baseball at loggerheads and uh i suggested to him that it might be of benefit to hear about the negro league's history of collective bargaining and at which point he said were wasn't no bargaining i can't remember how he phrased it he was he was having a little fun with it <laughs> um so we'll try to put this all into some hodgepodge or something and uh, type it up. Well, I'm looking forward to it because any time spent with Bob Kendrick is time worth spent. I mean, it's, he's, he's just an amazing man. He, a, a, absolutely. And, and to your point, you know, one of the 
benefits, it's not been a benefit for the museum, alas, right? All, all nonprofits and museums and, and such have really suffered in this time. But it's been a benefit to me that during the virus shutdown, we've had, we in our jobs have had a chance to slow down and pay attention and dig into some things we maybe wouldn't normally get to with a lot of hustle bustle. So I probably had more opportunities to talk with Bob in the last three months than almost anybody else and certainly than I've ever had. So we, Bob and I have had a lot of long talks uh, over a lot of current events and things with the museum in the last couple of months. Well, that's terrific. That's terrific. So, all right, Vahe, I really appreciate you stopping by today. And I imagine you and I will be talking again later this week. Okay, thanks, Mark. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Savannah Smith, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett. Tip of the cap to Vahe Gregorian for joining me today. Links to stories about college sports and Vahe's column can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, earlier in the episode, you heard me talk about the Sports Pass offer. It still stands. It's still a good one, 30 bucks for a year's worth of sports coverage, and that includes the Sports Extra that comes with the E-Edition. There are 20 pages of additional sports coverage today. Here's an even better offer. Buy the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news, features, commentary, analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus extra news, sports, and business coverage from national outlets. The details can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. That's account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Wednesday with another episode.